Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to our first episode of the Printed Circuit Podcast, where we discuss trends, challenges, and opportunities across the printed circuit engineering industry. I'm your host, Steph Chavez. Before I start and get into the details, let me at least give you a background of my experience and a little bit more about me. I'm a senior product marketing manager with Siemens. I'm the current and founding chairman of the Printed Circuit Engineering Association, an industry acknowledged subject matter expert in printed circuit design with over 30 years' experience. That covers the full spectrum across every market sector when we talk about commercial, aerospace, military, and automotive, as well as medical. My experience spans the technology gamut, whether it's simple to complex multi-layer um, HDI PCBs that have circuits that contain analog, digital, RF, and mixed signal, microwave, and power. So when it comes to design, I've definitely covered it. I'm a certified master instructor for PCB designer certification for IBC. I hold the highest levels of design certifications from IPC, the, which is the CID Plus, and now the new uh, PCA certification, the CPCD as well. I'm the co-author of the PCE EDU uh, design curriculum book and certification that is now being out and published to the industry. I also hold Cherish, uh, and, and close to my heart is that I'm a United States uh, Marine. I served uh, five years in the military as an avionics technician, so that's at the core of my foundation and my leadership. So that's me in a nutshell. And with that said, uh, joining me today is Chad Jackson, CEO of Lifecycle Insights. Chad, thanks so much for being here and joining in. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And by the way, thanks for your service. Oh, it's, it's my honor. Today, uh, we're going to center our conversation discussions around supply chain systems, where companies today aren't always equipped to handle the new normal. It's brutal today. And it looks uh, a little different or a lot different, not just a, lot, a little. It's a lot different than in years past. I know I'd had my recent uh, experiences that illustrate uh, this issue, but before I share, would you give me at least, a, um, give the audience here a brief background of who you are and, and a little bit more about where you come from? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. So at Lifecycle Insights, we conduct a lot of research. We publish a lot of guidance for engineering executives looking at tech-led initiatives, trying to help them figure out what's the right thing that they should invest in and how to go about it, which is no easy task. That's what we do. And I started the company back in 2010 and I'm still very excited about it. Awesome. Awesome. One of the other things I want to talk about was how do you define the new normal when you see how things are unfolding here in the industry? What's your take on that? I think you're right. You know, the, the industry did operate a certain way for a while. It worked, you know, but in recent times, we've seen really bad problems emerge with supply chain. Those vulnerabilities that kind of have been exposed very recently, they've been there for some time. There are some inherent flaws in the processes and the approaches that are used. Lots of functions in manufacturers were hindered by the pandemic. There's no doubt about that, but it really accelerated the problems in supply chain functions within a lot of companies and the supply chain themselves with the suppliers. Geopolitical turmoil is another factor that has played into this. You look at the trade war with China a little while ago, you look at the war between Russia and the Ukraine, those are contributing factors as well. We've been tracking this for a little while. This is one of those big issues that affects engineering organizations and how they approach things. So we conducted some research. You know, we went out and initiated some survey-based research on design and development and how supply chains related to that. And one of the biggest takeaways that we found was that 89% of engineers the respondents to the study reported that they had to remove or replace electronic components from PCB designs due to supply chain issues. So this is this is a real issue today, and it's it's manifesting in a significant way. I agree with you, and I, I can attest to that. Believe me, I've had my share as of recent in that regard. And the industry, it's definitely impacted us in, in how we do things. And I've used a Several of your industry feedbacks up from the surveys that you guys have produced have been outstanding. Let me just throw a little kudos to you guys as well. You guys are killing it with the surveys. Amazing uh, job of capturing what is actually happening in, in the industry and allowing industry subject matter experts such as, such as myself and many others out there who um, portray or promoting uh, that, that information that, that's real time, that's real. So thank you very much on your behalf. I, I want to make sure I say that. With the complexities of the enterprise operations to consider, you know, things like functional silos, disparate systems. With today's globalization, we see a distributed teams collaborating and functioning as one centralized machine. But the numerous suppliers that add into the complexity 
along with their ever expanding geographies. It's just it's it's getting more and more of a challenge. Then you have the fragmented cross functional decision making process throughout organizations. We see a, a very complex spider web like network of the in this informal process. And believe me, coming from a mill arrow background, I can attest to this like really like if you when you draw it, oh my God, it's a it truly looks like a spider web in the, in the way we discuss things. I mean, what is your take on that? Are you getting the same type feedback? Yeah, there's an interesting dynamic at play. And what I mean by that is that on one hand, it's one face or facet of digital transformation. That is an umbrella term meant to cover tech-led initiatives, but they're extremely popular today. There's a lot of organizations pursuing them, but they're, each of them are pursuing them in, their, in a different way. That's true of different suppliers. They will go out and pursue and acquire and implement and deploy new technologies and new processes. But the same is true of, of within a company. You know, different teams within the same company will be going off in their own directions. And as a result, you see this divergence of tools and sources of truths. It's kind of a tough one for us because we're advocates for that kind of pursuit. Digital transformation can deliver strong value, but if teams within the same company are going in different directions, sometimes competing or conflicting with one another, you can run into problems, right? That's one problem with it. I think the other side is, it's not just about org structure and and org problems. The overall sourcing process is also very antiquated and has some inherent flaws. So in our study that we conducted, 44% of sourcing is still done through supplier websites. Now, some organizations even start the process with a broad internet search. And of course, if you use those disparate approaches where the source of information is going to vary dramatically, the degree of accuracy of that information is going to vary dramatically, you are going to be making decisions off of an unstable, I guess, platform, if you want to think of it that way. You know, you're making decisions based on information that isn't necessarily to the same level of quality or accuracy. And inherently, that's going to lead you to a difficult place because it varies so much. How you adapt to the new change and what is happening, I can tell you there's so much of legacy processes that just doesn't have this inherent supply chain detail or the supply chain input up front. It's downstream. And back then, that was acceptable and that was okay. There's nothing wrong with it. And we've been successful up to this point. But one thing that COVID has definitely proven or this pandemic has proven is that those old processes need to be brought up. Our methodologies have to change our way of thinking and how we approach design in general and our collaborations. Uh, the silos have to come down and how we do things have to evolve and change. You know, some organizations, they even start the process with a broad internet search, you know, like manual searches. It's amazing that this is still going on. I mean, I can attest to that uh, myself, along with several other uh, engineering teams I've, I've been on. Well, these processes, uh, you know, they've worked in the past, as I said, the current state of supply chain markets is a challenge to rely on those approaches without any costly delays that attribute to respins. Let me share one of my experiences that I, I recently had. You know, we started a design off like any other design that we typically would. And this is, you know, right at the, the first part of when COVID really started to hit and, and affect supply chain. And um, we started the design off you know, as a normal project with the customer getting the requirements but very shortly into the layout phase of the design, when we were getting into the layout, just starting the layout, when the double E hands the, the schematic off, and at the same time, he's doing a bomb analysis, that's where the problems just un- started to unravel itself and unfold, in, uh, as we say, presented itself or themselves. Because it seemed like at every project meeting that we had attend to, supply chain was coming back and saying, hey, this part's not available, this part's not available. And it was a nightmare because it was like one step forward, two steps backwards. And you know, in Mill Arrow, most Mill Arrow companies, if you're using internal part numbers, that really represents like a minimum of two to four parts, you know, because they already have acceptable alternates that can be used. And so when you're having a part that says it's not available, that means that none of those parts are available. Then, you know, the issue became, do we design that feature out? Do we take the hit on the delay and wait till the part's available? Or do we try to find alternate circuitry to come up and that will produce the same requirement that's output. And that poses its own problem because then you go through the gauntlet of component engineers have to do their vet part vetting. And that could take anywhere from, you know, seven to 10 business days. And it was a nightmare. And when we um, 
we must have went through this process at least a dozen times before we finally finished the design. And it was it was a nightmare because it wasn't just like replacing a part. It was replacing enormous amounts of circuitry and moving stuff around. Think about every time that Double had to stop what he's doing, go back and he would just do an internet search. The problem is, is what he's finding and says, okay, I think this is it. He's not getting that supplier input of what is the, how many are available? What is the true delivery time? He doesn't have what we call that real time or what you would say that the real time knowledge. Is it real or is this just a number? I mean, it's, is it just, you know, something there, but in reality, it's not, you know, readily available or there's not, you know, a thousand piece reel available. And it was brutal. And by the time we finished that project, I mean, like I said, I must have redid that layout at least a dozen times. And it was very difficult for the entire team. And we went over budget because you think about all the extra hours and man hour, man hour effort that went into it. We delayed on our process in delivering. And it wasn't because the engineers weren't doing their job. Inherent to our process, it wasn't adaptable or wasn't set up to handle what is going on today. What I'll say is uh, you're not alone, (laughs) unfortunately. Based on our research, I mean, we found that 54% of the studies respondents said they replaced a board components due to availability, life cycle, or compliance issues at least once per board project. So 54%, you know, that's, that's a pretty high number. And then to your second issue about the difficulty of redesigning the circuitry or component of board 66% 66% said they stated it took more than 10 hours to redesign that aspect of the board. So you're not alone there. It's very, very painful. And, and man, I can hear the pain in your voice. Definitely feeling the pain. It is, and I use that term, you know, I used it in a few articles that I published and a couple of columns uh, that I wrote. And I use that term, feeling the supply chain pain. And that's absolutely true. There is pain on the engineer side. It makes it more difficult for them. But this problem doesn't just manifest for them. It actually manifests for the organization as well. So some other findings that we, we found was what was the effect on supply, just supply chain disruptions for these organizations? 48% cited the delay with the delivery or launch of products. 45% uh, cited increased overall product cost or cost overruns. So, you know, it's not just that, hey, life is painful and difficult for engineers and getting these things done. It is manifesting in a a monetary way for these companies. So it's a lose-lose situation. Chad, those are staggering percentages. In some cases, they could be catastrophic, especially if you talk about small business owners. And I'll give you, for example, uh, another experience I had. I was sitting with uh, one of my uh, dear friends and colleague who writes in in one of the industry columns, as well as he owns his own design firm. And you know, I sat and had coffee with him the other day and he mentioned the same thing. He, he mentioned the same exact scenario, parts not available, but even worse, this is something that I didn't know that is happening now. And I'll share with you and I share with the audience is that um, he's a small firm, less than 10 individuals in his company and he f- finds his parts, everything's good. He checks everything. He even validates verbally on the phone with um, where he's getting the supplier, where he's getting the parts from, places his order, gets a confirmation of, of the PO Everything's good. He's all excited. Hey, everything's good to go. He moves on to his next task, especially being a business owner. Two days later, he gets an email notice. Your part is now no longer available. Shipping delivery day is TBD. He got bumped. Why? Because he's a small company and somebody bigger that has the deeper pockets is buying more in volume, maybe a more higher priority tier of a customer. He got bumped. Have you heard of what? What is your take on that? Have you, are you hearing any, any similar stories? Yeah, I mean, it happens and it's really unfortunate, but I, it definitely happens. Absolutely. We, we don't have any findings regarding that, but yeah, it happens. But a bigger issue to think about if you forecast, you look into the future, depending on who you listen to, we're on the edge of a recession. The margin of error in these circumstances is, is getting thinner, right? It's going to get thinner in the next year or two years. So, this is a significant problem. This isn't just pain that engineers feel. We got to be careful about this because this can quickly translate into companies going out of business. Luckily, like I had mentioned, my, my dear friend and, and colleague, and luckily he, can, he was able to handle the impact, but it was definitely a financial hit because he missed his delivery. And, and um, you know, you think about the ripple effect that happens, you know, reputation and stuff. And small companies, 
luckily that's not the only you know thing in his the only egg in his basket and a small company can't can't take that kind of hit i love the details that you guys are collecting in with in your surveys and what you're sharing with us it's definitely on point in um it's really eye-opening and it will be interesting to see how the industry evolves and, and changes and if companies will accept the fact that they have to change in order for them to stay afloat or, or to be successful and or will resistant to change to stay with a formula that they feel, well, this has been successful for us and we're going to stick with it. How long will that last? It's a challenge, right? I mean, that fundamentally, a lot of organizations sometimes have hesitancy because there's risk. Already, you're working under tight schedules. Already, you don't have enough bandwidth. Introducing a change like an initiative like digital transformation, it can be disruptive if you do it the wrong way. But there's definitely a shift, especially for engineering, to more informed decision making. Whether it's shift left with simulation, let's let's verify before you go to a prototype. It's shift left with, you know, let's get all the information you need to make the right decision around selecting a component to put on board for sourcing issues. The impact of some of these are greater in a financial perspective than others. And this is certainly a big one and, and companies need to start moving in that direction. I couldn't agree with you more on that. Chad, that's awesome. I mean, your, your insight, keep it up. I think you guys are doing great. So as you could see, we're truly at a turning point here where the approach needs to change. I mean, the way we do things and how we're functioning, we've got to adapt to change in our new environment. And Chad, as you said, there's no light at the end of this tunnel. This is, this is our new reality. And this, you know, how, we, how we attack this or how we do this will, will dictate on where we're going to be in the next five or 10 years or, you know, and going forward. So, so tune in next time. For our discussion, we'll take a look at how existing infrastructures put you at a different disadvantage uh, because of resilience is not built into the process, you know, as Chad and I had discussed. Again, I want to thank uh, you, Chad, as well as everyone else for tuning in. I hope you continue to tune in and follow me on this Printed Circuit podcast. Bye.